Hey guys, welcome back to 10 Minute English with May. And today we are going to do a final review of the eight parts of speech. So remember, you want to understand your level one Lego blocks. By Lego one, I mean our eight parts of speech because they're one single word that serves a particular function in our sentence. So once you know your level one parts of speech, you can move on to the phrases. And these are our level two Lego blocks because they're words put together. And then afterwards, you can move on to your level three, which is clauses. All right. So level one, parts of speech. Level two, phrases. And we have six phrases. So we have eight parts of speech. I know that some grammar book says nine because they um, think that determiners is another type. But just for convenience sake, we kind of put them together. Um, determiners and adjectives. All right. And level three, that is our clauses. Okay. So one plus three. Okay. So let's get started. So the most important three parts of speech are nouns, pronouns, and verbs. So why is that? So just take a look at the first example sentence. Are Becky and Robin going to the beach? So this is a complete sentence, and we know that nouns and pronouns, they function as subject or object and or object of the sentence. So they are important. And of course, verbs indicate actions or conditions. So you always have to have a verb in order for the sentence to be a sentence. All right, so without a verb, you have a fragment and that is not a complete sentence. So in the case of nouns, Becky and Robin, you can see they are capitalized, right? When we're talking about people's names or brands' names, companies' names, these are called proper nouns, right? You want to make sure you capitalize it, all right? And what about beach? The beach is our common noun, right? So we don't have to capitalize it. Okay, and in the second example, the class is going on a field trip tomorrow. So what is the class? The class is a common noun. However, a class contains a group of people and that is what we call collective noun. So if you are taking the SAT, I want you to know that collective nouns are singular. I do know that some grammar book says it depends on the context. If you're talking about the group as a whole, as one unit, it is singular. Where, whereas when you're referring to the members of the group, it could be plural. But for SAT's sake, make sure you uh, know it's singular. All right. And what about field trip? This is what we call compound noun. Right, because the real noun here is trip, right? And field is a noun that is functioning kind of as an adjective in this case, right? Modifying the trip, like ice cream, that is a compound noun, right? Some compound nouns, they have a space in between, some have hyphen, and some are actually a single word. So with space, with hyphen or one word, right? So basketball originally um, was a compound noun with space. So we wrote it in two words, but now it's just one single word, all right? Okay, and most people cannot stand loneliness, right? People, uh, I'm sure you know, this is kind of like irregular common noun. So one person, two people, we don't add S. Right, whereas loneliness, this is what we call abstract noun because you cannot quantify it, right? It's uncountable, so it's always singular. 
All right, so moving on to pronouns. So we do know that pronouns are words that represent a noun. So it represents a noun before we've mentioned before, usually before, right? And this noun is what we call the antecedent. Okay, and you have to make sure that if you are referring to a plural antecedent, you want to use a plural pronoun. If it's singular, you want to use singular, right? This is what we call pronoun and antecedent agreement. Okay, so in the first example, all of the tables and chairs had been removed for the dance. If you remember this all, this is what we call indefinite pronouns. So we have eight kinds of pronouns. So if you don't remember, go back and review the pronoun lessons. There are six lessons in total for eight pronouns, right? And in the second example, a bibliophile is a person who loves and collects books. Okay, so the who here, this is a relative pronoun. So if you remember, a relative pronoun introduces an adjective clause. So we know that there is an adjective clause here, who loves and collects books. This is modifying the antecedent of person. Okay, so it's very important that you know relative pronouns, who, whom, whose, which, that. Okay, so I'm gonna write eight types of pronouns. Okay, and moving on to verbs. The first example, Windsor Castle has been a residence of the English monarchy since the time of William the Conqueror. So has been here, this is be verb, conjugated be verb in present perfect tense. So if you remember, we said that there are two main categories of verbs, right? We have something called transitive, which takes on objects because there's a receiver of the action and there's something called intransitive, which is there's no receiver. So it, it doesn't take on objects, right? No receiver. And under the category of intransitive, we have something called linking verbs. So the most common linking verbs would be be verbs. So their function is to connect the adjective or the noun after the verb with the object, oh, sorry, with the subject, not object, pardon me. So like in this case, you can see has been is the be verb. So it is connecting a residence, which is the noun, with our subject, right? Windsor Castle, okay? And the second example, our building was evacuated yesterday. So right away, you should know that this is a passive voice verb because there's be verb was and the past participle of evacuate which is evacuated. So this is a transitive verb because only transitive can be transformed into passive voice. Right, so we can actually uh, rewrite the sentence into active voice. The authority evacuated our building yesterday because of a gas leak. Okay, and the third example, penguins cannot fly or birds can fly, fish can swim. You can see that there is no receiver of the action. So this is intransitive as well, like the first example where there is a linking verb that's also intransitive. Okay, and remember that you don't want to confuse verbs with verbals. All right, so now we're moving to modifiers. So modifiers are not essential, so we can always cross them out without um, 
damaging the structure of the sentence. The sentence will remain intact. So in the first example, there are still a few gas lights in downtown Atlanta. Downtown is modifying Atlanta, right? So remember some nouns, they can serve as adjectives when they're modifying other nouns. So just one important rule, when a noun functions as an adjective, never add S, even if it is originally countable. So you don't say downtown Atlanta, right? You don't say fields trip, it's field trip. Okay, and second example, Johnny is a charismatic, handsome man. So we know that these two adjectives are a modifying man. So remember that there is a comma in this case because these two adjectives are interchangeable, right? And of course, in this last example, under adjective, that is a large wooden table. There is no comma here because the order of size and material, they are not interchangeable. You cannot say that is a wooden large table. So again, you want to refer back to the adjective and adverb lesson where I talk about the orders of adjectives. All right, so our adjectives modify nouns and pronouns, whereas our adverbs modify verbs, adjectives, and other adverbs. Right, so Tom has already finished his assignment. This is modifying has finished. We frequently go fishing. This is also modifying go. And of course, eat quickly, right? Modifying eat, all right? So you can see frequently, this is frequent plus ly. So when we have adjective quick plus ly, we have adverb. All right, so of course there are many different kinds of adverbs, some without ly, but that's the general rule. So don't ever use adverbs to modify nouns and pronouns. Okay, so now we are moving on to prepositions. So prepositions, they indicate that there is a prepositional phrase. And a prepositional phrase is simply a level two modifier. So it is the same as an adverb or an adjective. And that is why you can always start off by crossing out your prepositional phrases when you want to isolate your main idea, right? So as you can see here, the little boy squatted on his heels and watched the kittens play. So on is your preposition. So cross out on his heels. Heels would be object of the preposition, and you still have a complete sentence. The little boy, boy is your subject, squatted and watched. That is your transitive verb, the kittens. That is your object. Okay. And of course, in the second example, you always want to make sure that you cross out the prepositional phrase between your subject verb because you don't want to get subject verb agreement type question wrong, right? So some students end up saying, oh, students is my subject, but actually it's not because that is a part of the prepositional phrase, right? So your subject is actually each the indefinite pronoun, and it is singular, right? And the verb is must bring, okay? So cross out prepositional phrases, especially important when it's between your subject and verb. All right. And now, moving on to our last two parts of speech. So we talked about conjunction, right? We have two types. The first is coordinating conjunctions or coordinators. They are used to join equally 
important ideas, whereas subordinators, the blue ones, they indicate that there is a less important, a minor idea, right? And that is our dependent clause, okay? So in the first example, let's sit in the kitchen and talk. What is the end doing here? It is joining the two verbs. So remember that when you're joining two items, don't add S. You only add S when you are talking about a list of three or more items. And we have not only women, but also men. So not only, but also is our paired conjunction. So you want to make sure that, pardon me, you want to make sure that there is parallel structure. Okay. Okay, so in this case, you have women and men, and they are both nouns, all right? So you want to make sure that you are joining nouns with nouns, verbs with verbs, and adjectives with adjectives, all right? So the third example, John studied hard, so he passed the test. So you have a comma before your so here because you are joining your two complete sentences, right? Subject verb, subject verb. So remember this very important formula, comma fanboys equals semicolon equals period. Okay. And the next sentence, they will come if they can bring the children. So if is our subordinator. So our minor idea, less important idea is if they can bring the children, right? Same thing with because John studied hard. So we have a dependent clause, the minor idea here. And make sure you know that a dependent clause, the minor idea, has to go with an independent clause, which is the main idea, in order for it to be a complete sentence. All right, last but not least, we have our interjection. So we haven't dedicated a complete lesson to this interjection because it works independently. So it doesn't affect the sentence structure as well. And it's not important for SATs or other tests that you're taking. But as you can see here, no, we can't afford a new car now, or oh no, I lost my keys in the car, or yes, I do like that dress very much. So you can pretty much cross these out, right? You still have a complete sentence. All right, so works independently from the rest of the sentence. Okay, and that's it for our eight parts of speech. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.